You are listening to the Independent Dealer Podcast with hosts Luke Godwin and Jeff Watson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's do this. I got to start on. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, another addition to how I built this. And today, a special guest for me, uh, Clint Wagner from Bluff Road Auto Sales. And um, Clint and I are in the same town. And honestly, Clint's uh, probably my biggest competitor, but he does it better than me. And Clint's been in the business almost as long as we have. And uh, just a great operation. Lots of accounts. Buy here, pay here store. And uh, he's had two stores, one store now, and a uh, huge service operation. One of the best looking places you'll ever see. Anyway, thanks for being on the show, Clint. Uh, introduce yourself. Okay, Luke. Thanks for inviting me to, to join you. Quite an introduction. I don't know if I'm uh, 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 better than you, but I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, I'm Clint Wachter, and, uh, and I am in Columbia, South Carolina. I've been uh, in the buy here, pay here business for about 34 years. Uh, started small and uh, like, a, like a lot of people, and uh, still in relatively small, but uh, for one location uh, and for this area, it's probably a, maybe a little larger than normal uh, yeah. or average. Uh, but uh, it's been a good career, uh, and the internet is like uh has posed its challenges for me like i'm sure a lot of people uh raised my uh stress level some uh, the learning curve of it but uh happy to be here and luke uh be glad to try to answer any questions you yeah. have so clint you started um <clears throat> i guess in 86 or 87 somewhere in there 89 89 okay so okay. um and clint before that you were a salesperson at a store at a, at a new car store right uh that's right Luke. so i worked for new car dealers for three or four years uh before opening my buy here pay here store uh small store uh, inventory about 15 cars to start with and <clears throat> quickly learned i could sell uh about as many as i could afford to buy or finance uh Operated there, uh, selling my accounts to a finance company for a long time until I established a credit line. Uh, then moved down to the corner in, a, in an old uh, for a, a old McDonald's hamburger place. Uh, operated there for about ten years. Uh, opened a second location uh, because over the years. Uh, the cars inventory were more expensive and I kind of forgot about the, uh, the less expensive cars. And so I opened the second lot really to pick back up on those customers and, and, and retain that business that uh, I'd really uh, neglected to, to hold. Uh, <clears throat> the second lot property uh, was much larger than the first lot. And shortly after i opened a related finance company and soon discovered because all my customers were coming to the related finance company at the second lot i might as well join the two lots so mm -hmm. that's what i did and uh added service and a detail shop and and uh currently adding a paint booth and some things uh, I found that it's a lot easier to manage one store with 20 employees than two stores at 10 with 10 at each one. Uh, that, that poses challenges and I've hired some consultants from time to time to learn how to manage people. Really? That's what, uh, the challenge was. That's, that's interesting, Clint. That's the hardest thing I think in our business to, to figure out how to do is to manage people. Um, I believe, you know, so many people get the start, and doing what we do by selling cars. And, and honestly, that's the easy part. Um, and you've been doing this a long time and, and you've always had, I think a few more employees than I have. What, you know, how did you come to the decision to hire someone to help you figure out how to manage those people? Well, uh, when I had two stores, I also was transferring, uh, I started a related finance company. So that was, another uh, uh, process that was going on and 
I uh, uh, changed my accounting to uh, GAP. And, and so all of that going on now, I was pretty overwhelmed, especially when I learned I did not know how to manage people when I didn't have my eyes on them. I, I, that was uh, a really, by default, I learned that I didn't know how to manage people. People always did uh, pretty much what they were supposed to, got the jobs done when I was in close proximity, but uh, managing people uh, that you're not seeing every day is different. Things can get out of hand. I hired a consultant because somebody recommended I do that when I was complaining about my situation. And really it was the kind of things that the consultant implemented to my business, I would have thought silly before he said that. Uh, like what? Kind of Hands-on training that people require. Hmm. I really didn't understand why people had to be trained that way, that we're all adults, why don't we do what we're supposed to? But that's hmm. not what happens even in small jobs. And so I had to really regroup my, and, and think about that. And the other, the other reason I really didn't like that is that takes a lot of time and effort to train people that way. Uh, we created job descriptions and everybody is held accountable for doing their job on a regular basis. Uh, you have to do it that way. And I have to require my managers to hold their employees accountable on a regular basis for doing their jobs and their job description. And it's done by text. I send out reminders by text to my managers to remind their staff to do certain things on certain days. And I look at reports and that, <clears throat> that process, <clears throat> excuse me, has taken 50% of the burden off of me, I would say. And, and it sounds so simple and so easy. The training part is very time consuming. Yeah. For people to understand how you want things done, exactly how you, the person sitting beside that person is not going to train them the way you would and i learned that the hard yeah. way yeah it sounds Even like you went from you went from working in your business to working on your business for a phase yes and even if you don't do that, what the other things I learned was even the employees that have been with you for 20 years that are your key people, unsupervised time, they will begin to deteriorate some. Their job performance will drop. So uh, you can't put people in a place with people that know what they're doing and expect them all to, to raise their game or, or be taught uh, the way that person was taught. Um, Clint, did you go and personally train, are you right now personally train each employee or do you have some where you like your techs? I know you're not training your techs. Uh, what process have you put in place to make sure you're getting the training that you want each specific employee to have? Well, you mentioned service. So uh, that's, that was the last department that I worked on. Uh, sales was first. No, actually collections. The business office was first, so primarily collections, uh, then sales, and uh, then the service department. The, as you might imagine, it's the things that get done once a week or need to be done twice a week that don't get done. You walk out in the lot, the cars aren't straight, things like the cars aren't... It, it, those kind of that makes your lot look bad. That you lose your curb appeal. That yeah. you spend so much money and work hard to to get. So I have to meet with my manager and the salespeople at the same time and say, you have to have a certain day that you straighten these cars up and rearrange cars. You cannot change that day if you're here at nine o'clock that night because you got customers. That is your day, you gotta do it. And I'm gonna send you a reminder on that day to do it, and that's it, it's gotta be done. I send the manager the reminder. The manager's gotta get them out there and get it done. And that's it. So it's in my reminders, in my iPhone, to send him a reminder to get him to do it. 
part of your job. Send your job description and you sign that statement too. That helps. And yeah. It, it lets, if you put it in writing and make somebody get somebody to sign it, it does add uh, some seriousness to what you say. Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry to interrupt the podcast for just a second, but we wanted to make sure you guys know about our TaxMax partnership we have um, with the guys at TaxMax. Yeah, use the, awesome. use the promo code podcast. Um, you're going to get a discount when you sign up. Now is the time to get hooked up with TaxMax. Tax season is coming. I guarantee you that President-elect Biden and the people running Washington are gonna want a fat stimulus bill to come out at the beginning of the year. Hopefully they tie that to tax returns. We're, I, there's gonna be some money hitting the street, Luke. Oh, I, I guarantee you. And I tell you, I just signed up with TaxMax this week. It takes five seconds to sign up. We actually designated someone in our office. They're gonna be ones handling it. Uh, you know, I'm looking for a big tax season. We had a good tax season last year. But I think it's going to be better this year because of tax max. Yeah. And we've actually, this is being recorded uh, around the mid-December. We've done our first deferred down program oh, uh, really? for a customer. Yeah. We did a fourth quarter. We estimated their taxes. We sold them a car, rolled them out. They put a little bit down now. We're going to get a little bit more from their taxes. So we're already using it right now. That was a deal that we probably would have put together anyways, but we're able to get a little more down payment and it makes their payment a little bit affordable by getting our hands on some of that tax money coming in a couple months. Awesome, man. What's the, what's the code, Jeff? Uh, podcast. Podcast. Use code, yes. people. Be sure to use the code podcast. Uh, and uh, back to the episode. And Clint, can you give us kind of a quick overview of what, your, what the makeup of your uh, company looks like, your employees, your managers, how many salesmen, how many service techs, things like that? We average about 20 employees. So uh, there's a service manager. There'll be three service techs, two guys that uh, uh, keep the uh, wash cars, run errands, go get parts, things like that. We have three in the sales staff, a sales manager and two salesmen. The sales manager also sells cars. Mm -hmm. uh, we have... Uh, Let's see, two lady, two cashiers. One is a part-time collection cashier. She can stop and take payments when we get busy. Uh, we have one person designated for insurance. One person is the highway clerk, does all the tags. Uh, we have three collectors. Mm -hmm. One of the collectors wow. also deals with the repossession uh, uh, companies. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, how many and cars three support. Go ahead. I'm sorry, you said three support staff too? Yeah, yeah. My wife is a part-time employee. I have a, uh, a counter, a comptroller, and uh, one lady who handles the inventory. Um, then we have, to, we have a full-time detail staff here, but they're self-employed, They, uh, but they work out of my shop. Um, how many cars do y'all sell in a month uh, this year, Clint? Uh, we, we're going to average probably 60 a month, baby. This was a good year. Wow. Yeah. And that's because with two full-time salesmen and a sales manager. So each one of those guys are doing about 20. Yeah, they, they, they exceeded their, their annual average pay this year by about yeah. 35 to 40%. Yeah. That sounds like a great. <laughs> big year. They, they really operation. had a big year. So that puts we, about how many, with three collectors, how many accounts are you, are, do you have on the books right now? Or do you mind sharing that? 1,600, about. Woo. Yeah, he's big. It's, wow. Yeah, he doubled so, double me. So that would lend me to my next question. And again, if you don't need to, don't answer if you don't want to, but is that all, is that organic growth? Have you had to go into debt to get there? Um, how, what advice would you have for dealers that are saying, hey, I want to do what Clint did and I want to sell 60 cars a month and have 1,400 accounts, but where do I get the money? Yeah, that's the big <laughs> question. Um, uh, that's always been the question for me. Yes, I do borrow money. Um, mm -hmm. And, well, the average price or sales price of a car that I sell, it, I have a different model. Mm -hmm. uh, I sell cars for about $20,000 average. But my margins are like 
my competitors, Carvana, CarMax, and, and people. I cannot, you know, you can't mark a car up that you pay fifteen or $18,000 for the way you do when you, oh, yeah. when you buy one for five. It doesn't work right. that way. The famous. So most of our income is from interest, mm -hmm. uh, finance charges, mm -hmm. because the, the notes are larger. Uh, yeah. The repo losses are less because the margins were less in the first place. Right. So it just it's just different. The, 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 yeah. the profit and losses are in different places. Uh, and you're right. It takes more money to do it my way. So you've got to find a lender that believes in what you're doing and, and understands what you're doing. Yeah. And I've been able to do that with local lenders for a long time. It's getting more difficult. Yeah. Uh, and that explains the full time insurance person. Yeah. 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 You can't uh, be having someone wreck a $20,000 car without insurance. No, you know, try not. I mean, it happens, but mm -hmm. uh, we, um, we stay on the insurance and then we have our, uh, we use a uh, self insured insurance uh, plan or a uh, forced insurance plan if somebody mm -hmm. lets their insurance lapse. And that's our, um, our company. But it's, uh, you know, if a guy's not going to pay you and you're looking for him, it doesn't matter if you put forced place insurance on him. He's not paying you anyway. And it just, uh, so yeah, that risk is definitely there. We, we did start uh, checking credit here a couple years ago and, and scrutinizing a little better because losses mm -hmm. did go up. Be, like, like everybody, we face the same thing with, uh, national lenders setting up shop in new car dealerships and financing low credit scores. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's really affected your business. I mean, you know, your customer, because you have a higher income customer, I'm sure that you've seen that over the years, really, you know, last few years, dig into your business a lot, haven't you, Clint? Yeah, I've seen, um, uh, our repeat business is probably not at the level it was 10 years ago. As you know, Luke, I was probably the only show in town that did upper scale cars for buy here, pay here. So mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and you know, Dodd-Frank, well, I believe it was the new car dealers that were the only people that were included in uh, the Dodd-Frank regulation. So uh, I don't, I can see why they got into the uh, subprime business and of course, the results are they are uh, producing a lot of bad paper, uh, uh, overselling people and that sort of thing. So I think that's starting to come back around now. Mm. Well, it sounds think, like from your numbers, you guys are still doing pretty well despite that competition. Um, we had know, a big year this year, and we were helped by a lot of the stimulus money. Yeah. So um, I was hoping... Uh, to average about 45 cars every year as an average per month. Uh, I was selling about 30 at the other lot and about 35 at the, at the low income lot. When I joined them, I realized I don't want to double my sales because at that point, losses were too high. Mm -hmm. So we implemented some credit policies and, and uh, so we're trying to sell 45 good deals every month. Yeah, that's, that's so important and Clint, I think I, one of the things, one of the big things I learned from you was that you can, you know, we can sell as many cars as we can afford to in our business. But when you start qualifying people a little better, you know, you can pick the deals you want. And it sounds like that's really what you're focusing on now. I, I wondered, and I, and I'll ask this question. So Clint's original store was called University Motors and it had a great name, still has a great name. Um, it was a beautiful dealership uh, for what we do. Uh, beautiful dealership period and you moved to the other location and you, and you went away from your original name why'd you do that Clint? Uh, well I talked about it and <clears throat> all of my existing customers were already visiting my related finance company so that there was no advertising there uh, they already knew I had the second lot and knew where it was so that that now, all your past customers who did not have accounts, well, we linked the two websites. Uh, 
put messages out, advertise that way on TV. And I did that as opposed to getting another dealer license or moving a dealer license and new sign work and things like that. Uh, it was already kind of confusing. We had another dealership down the street operating under a different name. And I just, it, it just, uh, I kind of kept it simple. And that was during the period of time that I was facing challenges with learning to manage employees and changing accounting. So I was stretched pretty thin. I, some of it was, I just didn't want to take on the task at that time. Uh, so, uh, that was interesting that another thing I learned uh, in hindsight was, and, and you touched on the repo, you know, bad debt, things that occupy too much of your mind to keep you from uh, keeping pace, you know, and thinking about new things and all these internet changes and things we need to stay on top of. If you're, if you're mentally bogged down on your losses and things like that, it's just harder to manage the company. That's so interesting. And I, I always look at all these shiny new businesses I can get into. And, and I, uh, you know, luckily I have my wife who tells me, no dummy, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Um, have you ever had any of that come up, Clint, where you, your, your focus was shifting instead of doing this? You know, all the way down to my wife telling me, yeah, all the, <laughs> my wife tells me the same thing. Uh, every time I think I want, and, 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 you know, I'm, uh, well, I'm 60 now, so I'm starting to lose that desire to, to uh, even now that I know how to do it, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I want to go there again, and she sure doesn't want me to go there. Uh, I have a son who uh, finished school last year, and um, he has interest in coming here, so he's, of course going to work somewhere else at a car dealership for a year or two and then come over. But uh, that's what his plan was then. Uh, he may change. It. Who knows when you're 22 years old, you know, you just, <laughs> but that's, that was, uh, I can, I'm sure that the transition to a, uh, one of your kids is, is a pretty tough deal just by itself you know, to get somebody up to speed. And there's just no getting somebody up to speed. You've run this business for 35 years. Nobody can ever know it the way, you know, Luke, as you know yours or you and your dad do, or you just can't do it. Uh, well, you, you saw me go through that transition and how, I mean, you used to go and buy cars, my dad at the auction, and you saw him buying cars at, at a Mercedes store with it, that you were working at. So, I mean, you've, you've seen the evolution yeah. of how that works. Right, right. There's no more wholesale. We don't go to, I don't go to auctions anymore. Um, it, uh, if I did, I could only buy 10% of my cars while I was there and I would spend 70% of my time away from the dealership. So, uh, I don't know where this thing is going, but it, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's taxing to keep up with it. A young mind, I think would, uh, uh, a little more energetic and, and, and these and young people who stay on top of uh, the internet, they seem to uh, keep up with that a little better or it's less effort for them too. So Clint, I never asked you this before, but if you weren't in the car business or car industry, what would you, what would you be doing? You think, you know, um, I'm from a little town about 40 miles from here, Orangeburg and my family was in the, farm supply business, uh, not equipment, uh, fertilizer, feed and seed and chemicals and bulb grain and things like that. So uh, that's what I went to school to do. And uh, when I went in the business, that business was in a down cycle. Farmers were, it was hard to get paid for a lot of things you sold and everybody was depending on rain instead of irrigation. And so, uh, I went to work for the Hudson organization here at that time, being young. And, you know, at that time, a new car dealer would give you a nice new car to drive and all this. Uh, so that was it after that. And, uh, had a relative, a retired, uh, um, was my brother's father-in-law, got opened to buy here, pay here a lot. And he talked to me about it. And, Help me along. Of course, I uh, I got a partner to kind of wade out into the water with me. You know, it, it feels better 
two people going out together uh, would just start something off. And then he sold me his part after, I don't know, uh, eight or nine years. And uh, every time I do a little something, I double the size of my business, whether it's buying a partner's part of a business or moving down the street, they seem like they're huge uh, ventures to me, but I'm still real. I'm a one, still one store, you know? Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's interesting. Going through all those experiences, Clint, what would you, what advice would you give dealers that are listening that are maybe at the beginning of their journey or maybe they're, you know, in the middle or near the end? Well, what have you learned from all those changes? There's things you would do differently. There are things you would put into place. You wish you had done 20 years ago. Anything that sticks out to you? Well, the business has changed so much. The advice I would give anybody now would be much different than then. Uh, I would back then I would have done what car, uh, what is it? Drive time or somebody did. I would have borrowed every dime I could have and just grew as much as I could. And, uh, because it was much easier, less competition mm -hmm. today. Um, I think one thing that I've done and probably Luke could attest to this, that the simple things that everybody says, bankers always tell you, it's not how much you can loan, it's how much you can get paid for. And I've tried to apply that. That, that is so true, not just in the math of the number, because a small business person runs the whole company. And when losses, repos, looking for cars, whatever it is that's not profitable, that's taking up part of your uh, mind, that's bad. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't progress that way. You can't come up with new ideas and focus on other things. I think that's the biggest uh, downturn of bad deals is, mm. is the, the sleepless nights and, the, and, and, and you sitting around trying to figure out where some guy took your car. Yeah. That's just really wasted time. It, it could be spent thinking about how you could be better. That's so true. I think we've talked about that, Luke. I remember in the beginning, the first five years of, of running my buy here, pay here, I, I would I would have those days I'd come home from work and I would still be stressing about the fact that this car a car is missing I cannot find this car or someone wrecked and they owed me five grand and and that's gone and now it's a completely different mentality and it's not because you know I'm further along or have more money or five grand doesn't mean anything it, it just is what are you gonna do you know I, I can either stress over the fact that I can't find that car and it can ruin my day or I can just realize that that's part of doing business and focus that energy on making up the five grand somewhere else, you know, I think it's a great mentality yeah. shift for people. You can't totally let it go because you do want to find the car, but yeah. uh, the real answer is not to make the bad deal to start with, you know, if you can, <laughs> everybody has bad deals, but, yeah. uh, uh, it's getting harder to, to, to net money or make money from a bad deal. You can't really do it. You lose money now. I do. Uh, yeah, I do, I do too as well. Uh, Clint, if you had to start a, a car dealership today, would it still be buy here, pay here, or would you go a different route? If I had to start this today, I think I would, uh, I might leave off the car dealership part and be a finance company. Hmm. I might hmm. loan money. Uh, I would try to do that, I believe, uh, because, well, as you guys know, all the overhead is in the car, buying cars and processing those cars and getting them ready and paying people to sell them. Yeah, there, there can be profit there, but uh, at least on my end, because it's the more, as I said, most of my income comes from finance charges because of the price of the car and mm -hmm. the margins, finance company would be better for me. I think you're 100% right on that. And I, I've thought about that over the years. Just imagine if we didn't have to worry about sourcing inventory. We left that yeah. to someone else. How much more profitable could we be? And I, I think the number is largely more profitably profitable because you probably could could take a fee from the dealer that would essentially, you know, sure. do the same thing we're doing now. That's, that's you become credit acceptance, right? I mean, credit acceptance, Westlake, LaBelle, that's what those guys are doing, right? You just want to be a subprime lender hit the dealer for a big discount and try to collect. That's how I started in this business was being a subprime lender in 2008. Um, yeah. I don't know how they make ends meet without the markup side of it. That's the reason I got into the dealership was, I mean, the yeah. technology has come a long way. You know, you, if you look at like a credit acceptance, 
their formula, they value the car and their advances are based on what they can repo that thing for and resell it at auction. You know? Yeah. It's obviously a numbers game, but the yeah. overhead is not there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's, that's, that's, they're paying interest on the money and uh, they're paying collectors, but well, you, you probably, I don't know if you have a related finance company, but you, you see how those numbers break apart. It's hard to get yeah. enough expenses over on the finance company side. Well, yep. that's a question for that, Clint. What does your average deal look like? I mean, would you break down? I mean, I know both you and Luke, you, you both sell high-end cars, and it sounds like you might even be more high-end than Luke does he's, in the buy here, pay here. He's, a couple, selling, he's a couple thousand above me. Yeah, if you're selling an average $15,000 car or plus, you're making two to three grand on the front end, and then you're carrying the note at 19% interest or? Yeah, uh, our interest tier tears up with the price of the car. Tears down as the oh, car, yeah. price car goes up. So yeah. it, let's just say it's a, a round figure. It's a twenty thousand dollar car. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it would be about nineteen point nine at three thousand down, fifteen percent. And they'd have to have three thousand down, nineteen nine. It's a twenty thousand dollar sales price, ACV of maybe seventeen. Uh, yeah, maybe something like that. Uh, You're putting you a know, couple but, grand markup. So a good healthy varies. amount of money hitting the road. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, uh, uh, the, the margin is going to depend on how much you spend on it after you get it here usually. But so uh, let me ask and, you that, and, you Clint. Know, sorry to jump on you again, but I want to ask Luke that same question. If you have, I see you have a 2014 Dodge Charger in stock, 64,000 miles on it. Is that 64,000 mile Dodge Charger going to take less in recon than a hundred and twenty thousand mile charger that's a couple years older. Yep, yeah, uh, it's going to take less. It's going to take less. Have you guys found that? I, I guess the I'm not having any. Called, yeah, the reports are more because it's a newer model car, but it, you shouldn't have to. Uh, you don't uh, really put less into it. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, and that's not necessarily true, but I would say on average it might it'd be a little – it's mm. not going to be a lot different. Was it going to be $150 different on average or something? I, yeah. I think it's probably I think it's probably 200 max, but what, what ends up happening is with that, that newer car, your body recon is more. And so the car has to look so much better, so you end up spending money on cosmetics and less yes. on mechanics. Is what ends mm. up happening is what I've seen. Is, is that the same case with you, Clint? Well, yeah, our cars, uh, you know, I can't even buy a car uh, that it doesn't make sense for me to buy a car really with a, a, a rating less than three five. Mm. Uh, it just doesn't make sense because I'd have, I have to do so much to it. Now, I might go down to a three two on a, you know, a truck or something because they're so uh, hard to buy, but are, di are so expensive, but you still have to get them up and they got to look good. Um, and I, I don't know what your costs are, but you, you know, you buy a car at an auction, which is where almost all of my cars come from. You put, so you're going to pay top dollar when you buy it, then you're going to pay a fee on top of that, then you're going to get it back here, and then you get it back here and spend $1,200 average on them. Uh, you know, it's uh you're financing a lot on that car. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess my argument is I feel like on my five thousand dollar ACV stuff, I'm, you know, I'm still going to average fifteen hundred dollars of recon, give or take some, and then on my more expensive stuff, I'm still averaging fifteen hundred dollars of recon, give or take some, both because the parts are more expensive, and both because just because it's a sixty thousand mile Altima doesn't mean it ain't going to need a transmission you know, one out of three times. Like, so I guess I have that argument. I guess the only, the, the point where it makes sense for me and both your guys' business models is that nicer car with 60,000 miles, you're going to be able to take that in on trade in two or three years and give it a second life at your dealership if you, if you decide to keep it around with 120,000. Well, it's two things. It's the interest income on the more expensive car and they're lost on the repo of the more expensive car. So, you, you know, you, you're not gonna lose as much because you're not gonna margin it as much. Right. 
And so it, it's a, a, it's a whole different set of challenges with the, with all the cars being, and I don't, I'm not saying it's better at all. I, I you know, I, uh, you know, there was a time when I was 75% car dealer, 25% finance guy. I feel like I'm kind of the other way now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, 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 and it's a different set of accounting challenges. Uh, yeah. You know, your discounts and so forth going over. Uh, so, I, I, um, I don't know. It's been a while since I've been out of the business, the traditional buy here, pay here car lot that buy that probably averages spending what eight or nine thousand dollars on a car when they buy it oh no that's uh it's probably the average now clips in the fives i would think Six, oh really yeah. okay <clears throat> so yeah i mean it's we yeah you've long passed it and i'm i'm past it for You're several years yeah and i've creeped up more too i mean that's that's the hard thing for me is i start saying well i'm, I'm buying a eight thousand dollar car and i'm only making three grand on my eight Whereas opposed to back in the day, I would buy a four thousand dollar car and make three grand on my four. I was almost, you know, I'm basically doubling my money but at your, the time of sale. But your, interest, but your interest is so much less on that car compared to what you, what it is on the higher price. Right, car. but I can do twice as many or three times as many. But you're I'm still have I'm still putting that money on the road. It it does take twice mm -hmm. as many sales, and I get that if I finance a more expensive car, I could do half as many sales, still put you know three hundred thousand on the books every month. Uh, with half as many sales, arguably at the same interest rate. Um, it's the other it's thing. Yeah, and, and plus, the bigger, the larger spread of price range you have, the better selection you have, in other words, the more cars you're going to sell, especially now with the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't buy more. a three, $4,000 car on, uh, on simulcast. You're in, a, you're in a world of hurt if you try to do that. Yeah, and people are searching more specifically now, you know, about the make and model of the car. They know mm -hmm. about what, they're, they're dialing in on what cars cost a lot better now than they once did because of the internet. So I think, uh, yeah, it's a, a, if you can broaden your, I've done that several times. And when we're now at from probably twelve or $13,000 to twenty-eight or $9,000 is what we are selling now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the, you know, to, to get, we want something for everybody. And unfortunately, when sales start to, oh, we're off five or six percent, a good way to get that five or six percent is going to 30,000, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, how, so how do you, but, but at $20,000 at 19 or 15 percent interest, I mean, that's a, that's what, an eight or nine hundred dollar a month payment? Uh, no, we don't have payments that high. $20,000, mm. you know, with $3,000 down. If you're doing a car like that for four, four and a half years, most of our payments are in the fives, maybe six hundred dollars okay. a month. So we're doing forty-eight payment, to fifty-two months, fifty-four months kind of loans. Depends on the car. A lot of these cars mm -hmm. that we sell will have thirty or forty thousand miles on them. Not, not most of them, but a lot of them do. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that, that's smaller cars. That's not a truck or something. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, it depends on the car. We, we do what works for us. Uh, we mm -hmm. know what our customer base looks like and what the income looks like. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's got to fit. Yeah. Sorry to break in here in this episode, but we've got to remind you of Dealer Re. The only way to build wealth in our industry is with the reinsurance company. Jeff, you got one, right? Yes, 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 yes. I set mine up. This has been my first full year. Um, in so many ways, it's helped. I mean, obviously, uh, the tax deferment, the uh, you know, just having a formal warranty company as opposed to just kind of my pseudo in-house company that I was running before. It's it's really nice to give these guys an eight hundred number when they have a breakdown and say, "Hey, call ABP. They're going to direct you what to do." That's right. And then my shop you. can step in. That's right. Dealer Re, Tim and Taylor Bird over there are just really super guys. I talk to Taylor at least once a week. Um, and I tell you, great service. In my opinion, they're the only ones to go with. Dealery, give them a call, get hooked up. Hey, Clint, you had something interesting happen, uh, I guess about six, eight months ago, where uh, your Facebook um, was hacked and somebody stole, I guess, your inventory and listed it with very low prices. And I, I know you spent 
a month or so uh, getting that fixed. Can you kind of walk us through that and, and what happened and how you resolved it? Well, yeah, that, that was a, uh, well, let, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. We noticed a scam in June of this year and it was someone selling cars on Facebook marketplace for, you know, ridiculously low prices, say a third of the value or a fourth of the value, mm -hmm. right in that 1200 to $2,000, uh, relief fund money, you know, range, uh, people mm -hmm. that were getting those checks. So they were targeting people like that, you know, I feel like, so we were filing a complaint and on Facebook in the, the instructions where it tells you how to do that. There was a chat link. We chatted, said, Hey, look what's going on here. Uh, in two days it was gone. Now this, this scammer, what they did is they put these cars online on, on Facebook marketplace. They were cars that they just took pictures of. They weren't cars at all. They didn't own cars. They mm -hmm. put them for sale, but they used our phone number, our website, oh. a name that was very similar to ours called Bluff Online Sales or Bluff Road Online Sales. And then there was a email address that was not ours and a messenger account that was not ours. So what would happen in that case is if a customer were to go to the website, they would see our website and they, hey, this car is not on their website. Or if they called us or did both, we'd say, no, that's somebody trying to scam. That's not our car. And so they were safe. But if they communicated by email or messenger, they didn't know who they were talking to and they got scammed. And you had to uh, lose money? Uh, yes, I know of six people that gave uh, anywhere from $1,200 to $2,500. I would, I would bet there were three times or four times that many because people don't like to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> and so it was real. And now what happened is two weeks later, the scam was back. Same guy, same thing. But they had grown a little more sophisticated this time. They had, uh, they had a Facebook marketplace name and the Bluff online name was actually a Facebook page. So they had a like, uh, bluff road marketplace or something. So they had changed things up a little bit. <clears throat> so same, same scenario. If the customer communicated by messenger or by email, a scam attempt was made. If they called us or went to our website. Now, by this time we had a big banner across the website and said, Hey, there's a scam going on uh, uh, informing people. We reported it to Facebook hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Did no good. I got the Richland County Sheriff's Department involved and they were able to contact Facebook and get a person on the line through their child trafficking investigation sources. <laughs> Facebook took the information, did nothing about it. <laughs> uh, I, of course, reported it to Consumer Affairs and, and, and they sent letters to Facebook and I sent letters to Facebook and nothing happened. Uh, a customer of ours, at, now this went on for three weeks. And you we said got, that your phone was ringing so much that you couldn't do your normal business, right? One Saturday, before, our phone rang every 10 seconds. Oh my God. Mm. We had two or three people show up at the lot with the ad in their paper every day. Yeah. Ad in their and angry paper. at you because you didn't have the car at that price. <laughs> just, just, oh, uh, uh, but yelling at you like you set up the scam. Something that generates that kind of phone traffic, they're getting some people for money. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we put the banners up and, and, and did the best we could in the meantime. Uh, a customer 
inquired about one of the cars. He knew it was a scam. Mm -hmm. Inquired about one of the cars and said, sent them a link and said, this is the car I'm interested in. And they clicked on that link and it was an IP address buster. And they knew as soon as they clicked that link, they had messed up. So I took that IP address. I had already reported it to the FBI. There's an FG3.com website that you can report this stuff. And that's the best place that I found to report anything. And it's called but what I, again? It's, I believe it's FG3.com. Hmm. Uh, I'll look it up in a second for you. Uh, that, that's the FBI. So I went back and I edited the FBI report that I had made the day before and put that IP address in there because I remember they asked, do you know the IP address? And those, and it was gone the next day. <laughs> so it, the, uh, I, I guess a combination of them clicking on that IP address. Yeah. But three weeks of that, it was tough. Yeah, yeah, it's hard because then you're spending money you, you're redesigning your website, you're making banners, you're doing all these things to try to, to save your name and, and save your hassle and headache. Um, well, there's, a, there's a good it, internet attorney downtown in Columbia. I called him and he just said, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking just, right now, if you just pull up the marketplace in your area, I'm on a 50 mile radius of my town and I would say probably one out of every four of these ads is, is a scammer. It's fake. Um, it's amazing how that can affect your business and, and how it did affect your business. Yeah. They, they, now this scammer has evolved, you know, I, I, he changed things the second time to where I guess he met Facebook's or he wasn't breaching their criteria some way by doing some name changing or mm -hmm. using two different, he was pretending to be like an advertiser is what he was doing when Facebook would challenge him. Now he's moved on to another dealer. Hmm. And just to tell you, you got to fight these guys and get rid of them no matter what it costs. Now, I don't think this other dealer is responding very well uh, because he's doing all of the things that the, the scammer is doing, all of the things he was doing to me, plus he has made an exact duplicate of the dealership's website <laughs> and just lowered all of the prices by about 75 percent wow it's just a different url but people don't know your url they know your website and and so now i don't know what he's done about the phone number or not but he is uh so the website piece that was protecting some people with us is now gone yeah he, he's he's dropped that and uh uh you know i call that dealership i, I well, I wonder what these people are doing. Are they do and that somebody just answered the phone and said, oh, that's just a scam. And I, you know, I was like, well, that's... You're going to have to deal with it. Oh, you're going to have to... The scam will never go away as long as they're making money on it. And yeah. um, I wish they would do something. It's bad for people. That, that dealership is also a competitor of Luke's and mine. And, and, and every two thousand dollars they steal from somebody that's you know they can't buy anything else with it that's right that's out of the market that's our money out of the market yeah well yep. my argument would be that guy probably needs to be out of the market i think if you're <laughs> if you're so gullible that it's a 2007 accord with a hundred thousand miles for a grand with a well, random picture of some place or some know, weird email address and you're gonna wire him money this guy's not a car dealer this guy is something that this they're in new york somewhere is where the ip yeah. address busted now that could be a different server but it, it that's where it came up and uh mm. you know it could be people in another country you know yeah. and uh you would be amazed jeff at how how little a lot of people that are in business know about this i had other dealers saying on you know, making comments yeah they're scamming people and stuff and i'm looking at that and I'm like wow it's, it really, no wonder scams work so well. People are so, uh, you know, they know so little about this kind of stuff. Hmm. Well, Jeff, you uh, you got anything else for Clint? Luke, Clint, no, I think uh, this, it's all great stuff. Yeah, great um, information, good to learn. Um, hopefully the dealer community is, is taking stuff away from Clint's story. It's, it's really interesting. And uh, it goes to show that, I mean, the buy here, pay here model, the car business, there, there's a million different ways to do it, you know? It is. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Clint. 
Luke, Pat, the Jeff, good. Appreciate y'all inviting. Thank you for joining us today. Hope this episode inspired you to take positive action. Remember to subscribe so you get each episode the day it comes out. And we would love your help spreading the word. Leave us a review and share this podcast with your dealer friends. Dealers helping dealers learn and grow together.